just talk about that. And we're here with Tony Moore. Oh, I got a yeah, of course, man. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about the, what they did with Carl? <laughs> oh, you know, I, I thought I'd just take the bad hit off right away. Yeah, no, yeah. it's, I mean. Because we're all kind of pretty messed up about us, though. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm kind of on the outside of the situation. So, I mean, like, I don't know their logic behind it. So, like, looking at it from outside, like, yeah. It's not a decision I would have made. But no. uh, at the same time, like, I don't know. I, you know. What do you think Rick would, what is his motivation now, kind of thing? Like, he's yeah, got his little I mean, girl, of course, but, I mean, you know, he goes on his, say, tangents and stuff most of the time, so he's pretty busy with his own craziness, but. Yeah, yeah, and uh, oh. with, I don't know, with the announcement recently of uh, Andrew Lincoln leaving also, like, I don't know what the, I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, if you haven't yeah, heard that, that's, if you haven't seen that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's So, yeah, now I, uh, <laughs> Crap. I don't know exactly what the future holds. I don't know. It Look, seems, I, yeah, like I said, I, I try to wrap my head around like what logic goes on behind closed doors there, and yeah. Yeah. I can't figure it out. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, th you'll be getting a healthy dose of Daryl soon. Uh, yeah, okay. They, 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 they paid him a whole lot of money. <laughs> so he's going to start talking? <laughs> I guess it depends on his appeal to the crowd. If everyone wants him to be silent, you just have this leading man who doesn't say much. <laughs> I know you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to draw the first issue of The Walking Dead comic? Uh, jeez. Uh, it was a long time ago. I don't even remember what I ate for breakfast. Actually. <laughs> uh, I would imagine it probably took me a couple months. Um, yeah, like my Marvel stuff now, I get about six weeks per issue, um, and then on top of drawing the book, I was also doing the, the gray tone stuff on it, which took me another couple weeks. So I'd say all added up, it was probably a solid couple months. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Thanos. Um, was some scenes of the show accurate to your like illustration of the comic book? like how you how you pictured it yeah i mean especially within the first few episodes um that first season stayed pretty close to the the first trade paperback it didn't really veer far outside of that um you know until like the second third seasons um but yeah the first the first time i saw the pilot episode like i had goosebumps the whole way through because it felt like they had just somehow like you know, reached into the page and pulled it out into real life, like uh, seeing Andrew Lincoln uh, riding the horse into Atlanta, like that scene, especially for me, because I spent so much time drawing it, like I sat and looked at that page for a long time, and then to see it, and when they had it up as their, the, the posters, and then like I went out to LA for the premiere, and it was up on billboards, like everywhere I turned, uh, this image. <laughs> That it's been so much time drawing, and then they turned it into like a real thing. Uh, like it was surreal. It was like uh, it's like those scenes in, in Nightmare on Elm Street when they're wrestling Freddy Krueger in the dream, and then they wake up and he's in the bed with them. Like they pull him out of the dream. That's what it felt like. Uh, and it, yeah, it was just so bizarre. Uh, honestly, like it's just yeah, it was a surreal experience all the way around. Kind of on that same topic, how does it feel knowing that? Like this piece of art that you did for the cover of number one gets homage so much. Yeah, uh, I mean, like that's up there with the classic covers in comic book history now. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird because, like, um, you know, when I was doing the cover, like, I mean, I tried to make something punchy, you know? Right. But, like, um, like trying to make something, like, iconic is futile because like right. you know like how can you even do that so I just tried to make something that I thought looked cool um, and then uh, um, yeah to see it like you know given the nod so many times by other artists uh, especially like you know when it's artists like um, when Todd McFarlane did that one on Spawn like yeah. I mean I grew up reading Spawn like it's half the reason I draw comics now um, mm -hmm. you know because when I was 12 and that book dropped 
that changed my life. Right. Like, I mean, it blew my little mind. And, uh, you know, to, to see that he gave it the nod, I'm like, it's weird. It's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. Uh, but, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, it's such an outlier in so much, you know, like, most of my life is pretty normal, you know. Like, uh, I live in a small town. I don't leave my house very often. And, uh, um, you know, my day-to-day -day life is just, you know, get up, do some work. <clears throat> Kid, go, yeah, wife, yeah, do kid, do the wife, take the dog out for a poop, like <laughs> standard shit, you know. Like I don't really do that much, um, uh, but and then like that, you know, or, or you know the the TV show being like so so ubiquitous. It's like literally, like I could go to Walmart and you know, like it's like I saw a, a Mountain Dew uh, ad on the little cooler at Walmart, like the Impulse Rack cooler, yeah. and it was like a Mountain Dew Walking Dead promotion. And I was like, man, that's so weird. Like, it's all so weird. Do you get royalties for any of that stuff? I uh, can't really go into the logistics <laughs> of how that operation works. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and, and, and like, you know, I'm standing in line at Walmart, like, cashier doesn't know who I am, but yeah. people in front of me and behind me, they don't know who I am. Like, it's it's funny. And yet uh, they're surrounded by something and you help Yeah, right? half of them are wearing Walking Dead t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. so like, like, I have no clue. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah. And guys, keep in mind, I, I get that this is labeled a Walking Dead panel. If you want to talk about Fear Agent or his Marvel work or stuff he's done for DC or whatever, that's cool, too. Go ahead. Also, I want to give a shout out to Jeff. Cool. Um, <laughs> and also, you can catch uh, Spawn and Ray Player One. And um, anyway, I have a question. Um, we, um, in the in the, um, I know you're not doing the Walking Dead anymore. Sure. But um, if but um, if there it but um, is was there one like would you like was there like and. Sorry, I'm a little tired today. Uh, was there one that uh, idea that any, that anybody had of like um, of like sort of like a and I know you did the illustration, but um, um, was there any like pe uh, like something like the uh, um, of, of like a community of um, like an animal activist group and like because like um, when I watched The Walking Dead, there's like a lot of like animals and even Shiva like mm -hmm. the tiger um, and one of the scenes that really sparked in my mind when they're going to like stuff and all this there might be like a lot of alligators and all that mm -hmm. did you got like did you ever saw the like having like like thinking of like them introducing like, the community <coughs> was both like was both like an, uh, humans but also having animals in it I mean I would imagine in a scenario uh, like a post-apocalyptic scenario like this uh, human <coughs> activist <laughs> like taking care of humans is probably hard enough um, but and especially you know when large parts of you know uh, the world will have been reclaimed by nature essentially it's probably less of a concern um, as far as like the, the local ecosystem is concerned like I, there's a, a wildlife refuge not far from my house, and I go there all the time because they do like raptor rehab and um, a lot of you know like wild cats and uh, wolf. Uh, yeah, there's several species of wolf that they keep there. Uh, fox, you name it. If it's a wild animal, especially if it's indigenous to the area, right? Uh, they they rehab them there, or if they're too injured to let loose in the wild, they keep them and you know take care of them. Um, but I would, you know, that's all because of man's intrusion on their, their, you know, their turf. But, you know, some shit like apocalypse and Walking Dead jumps off. Uh, that's not gonna be a problem for them anymore. Like, <laughs> it'd be like uh, I don't know if you've seen like the outskirts of Detroit. Like there are large neighborhoods that are just reclaimed by nature. Just trees growing right up through the middle of houses because nobody's lived there. And, 15, 20 years yep. or whatever. And it's like, uh, yeah, just neighborhoods of abandoned houses. And that's that's kind of what it would be, I think. 
Sure. Um, we'll go Thanos and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> um, was there, and this is for a, like um, a general question for your job in general, was there any like rough sketches that you wanted to, to like put in the pages but couldn't because uh, the writer said no? Um, I mean, most of the stuff, like I had some character concept stuff that, that never became a thing. Um, but most of the stuff that I, you know, I was working on, um, like I would get the script and kind of mull it over in my head and then, um, you know, try to suit the work to what was in the script. Um, you know, if we had ideas along the way as we went, like we, we worked in the same, like probably 15 square feet. So he had a spare bedroom at his house and I had no extra space at all because I lived with like 10 other guys. Um, so, yeah, we spent almost every day about this far apart from each other for a few years. Um, so, yeah, we uh, there wasn't much that we didn't kind of corral on, you know. Like it was it was a two man bullpen the whole time. So, um, you know, there were a lot of like little doodles handed back and forth, whatever. But um, at that point, most of the work, especially once we got into it, like most of the work we were doing was just for the project, like trying to, you know, fine tune a thing that we already had in front of us. Now I know with, they, I think it was always said, you know, we're never going to really get into what happened, like how it came about. Mm -hmm. Did you guys kind of have that plan behind the scenes so that you guys knew? Um, no, because honestly, I mean, like, I don't know if, if Robert has his own kind of, you know, ideas that he's, right. you know, like percolated in his head. But, or behind it, but going into it, we thought like the mystery is always cooler right. than knowing. You know, like uh, I can't think of a single instance where you had like a mysterious circumstance and then you learned whatever it was behind it, and you're like, oh, that makes it more cool. Like, yeah, Wolverine was Wolverine, cool, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that pops right into my yeah. head. You got 10 years of not, or I mean, 25 years, years of not of, knowing yeah. anything about this guy, and then in like three issues. You're like, oh, that's it? Like, yeah. Can I go back to not knowing? Like, oh, that's yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. We had a question up here first, and then we'll come back. Uh, me? Yep. All right. So uh, for the pilot of The Walking Dead, how did you feel about them expanding on Rick's life before the apocalypse happened? Because like in the first issue, it sort of just jumps into the apocalypse. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a necessity to kind of flesh out the world. Um, you know, otherwise there's not, like, with comics you're dealing with fairly condensed storytelling. Um, I mean, we're, some comics are re really expanded storytelling, and it takes a long time to, like, get to the meat of what's happening. Uh, with, with this, we knew we, I mean, there's a strong chance that we might only get a few issues. Because, um, you know, you never know going into it. I mean, when we launched this book, uh, we were the zombie book, and there was a whole line of horror books. There was a, a, a Dracula one, there was a Frankenstein one, there was a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And they all came out the same month. It was that October. And within a few months, they were all gone except us. And so we thought, like, we got to kind of hit the ground running with this thing and, like, you know, uh, try to establish the stakes as much as we can, but at the same time, like, we can't. We gotta get to the meat of this thing pretty quick or they'll tune out. So, um, yeah. And that's kind of the, the thing with all new books. I mean, any, even if it's an established book, like, you gotta figure out that balance of, like, how do you uh, set the status quo and then wreck it and start your story, like, right away. Um, you gotta have some sort of stakes, but you also have to have a little bit of a, um, a life before to, to kick off any story. That's just part of yeah. uh, basic storytelling. That's Campbell. Yeah, that's that's storytelling 101. Yep. Uh, have you ever done any work and kind of finished it and thought it was okay, but then you got a lot of people saying, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And then maybe vice versa, where you did something and you thought, this was good. This was this was the top notch. And people were like, eh, it's okay, it's good. Uh, I mean, usually the the that response comes financially. 
Uh, so, like, I mean, I was pretty happy with the work I did on The Walking Dead. A lot of it was done a lot more quickly than I wish I had to do it. Um, but ultimately, I was, like, just really happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it took a minute to catch some traction, and then it took off. Um, you know, that was, like, 15 years ago now. So, you know, like, the work I did when I was in my early 20s, like, now I'm almost 40, and I have to come to a real, like, I have to kind of become at peace with the fact that the work I did maybe at the beginning of my career might be the most famous piece of work I have the rest of my life. And so, like, that's a weird thing, uh, you know, because, like, like, I revisited that number one cover for a variant of uh, number uh, 150, and I used the same layout, and I just, like, updated it. And then going through that process of revisiting that art, I, I could see, like, in real time how much I'd learned in those last, you know, 10, 15 years, uh, like, in action as I was redrawing a thing. I was like, oh, my God, like, that's how I inked. Um, <laughs> and, like, you know, I'm a world better at it now than I was. I've learned a lot since then. Uh, you know, and then financial, like, vice versa. Uh, like, I did a book uh, called Fear Agent right after that, and um, we thought, like, sci-fi is going to be the next thing. Like, we're, we're, we're on it. Yeah. And it was the next big thing. It just took about ten years to get to it. Um, so, yeah, we pitched this big... Uh, space opera thing that we, Rick Remender and I had our hearts in, and we loved that book because uh, it was our baby. It was uh, we got to scratch any creative itch we wanted. We put it into that book, and we loved it. And nobody wanted to buy it for a really long time, and so uh, it it teetered on the verge of being canceled most of the time we were putting it out. Um, uh, so it was a real kind of. Uh, I want to, like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill, like for us, you know, we'd get get another issue, drop back down, do another, do another one, and then hope that we can hang on long enough to just keep putting it out and get the story told. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was a thing, you know, like it was a labor of love, so we were super attached to it, we were super motivated to make our best work. Honestly, I think uh, there are a few issues of that that I think are some of the best books I've ever drawn in my life. Um, and so, you know, it's, yeah, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you, you, got, you always got to try to swing for the fences. Sometimes the stuff you think uh, you really got a hold of something, people just don't necessarily respond to. I mean, I do that with art prints. Like, I'll do a, a drawing. I'm like, man, that is kick ass. I'm going to make a bunch of art prints. I'm going to sell them, put together the art prints, and they don't want them. Nobody, like, they just sit on my shelf, and they don't move. Mm -hmm. I, you can't, like, you, you can kind of, pander to what you think people are going to want, but ultimately, like, most audiences are going to respond the most to something that, you know, like that authenticity of, you know, your own personal enthusiasm for a thing. Sometimes it pans out, sometimes it doesn't. You just got to roll those dice and, you know, at least you got the satisfaction of the work. If it helps, I think Todd McFrog's in the same boat, whereas his peak art is years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're probably going to stay there. <laughs> I thought that about his toys too. I collected a whole bunch in the 90s. I'm like, oh yeah, there's all these variants. This stuff's going to be worth money. I'm like, I can buy them now too for $20. Nothing from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> over here. So do you find that you ever draw for yourself anymore these days just because it is your job or do you always feel like you're drawing for everybody else? Type it, you? It's, it's 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 it has been a long time since I was drawing for myself. Yeah. Um, and I occasionally try to make sure I get out and do something fun for myself. Um, so I, I started, I, no, I noticed like I was getting into this trap of solving similar problems with the same solution over and over. Um, so I started trying to do like, like, when I lived in Kansas City, there was a thing called Dr. Sketchies, and it's like a life drawing like party, basically. They have like booze, and, like burlesque dancers or models. And, that like, like it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Where is it? Yeah. And, uh, I would uh, I would go and yeah they had like, and so it was like life drawing like figure drawing just like it was in art school but mm -hmm. like party time and uh, and I loved it because I could get out of the house see people like be social and uh, you know kind of get those brain cells moving again and 
do some life drawing because that's the ultimate the, the fundamentals are what it was all about and uh, yeah. you know once I kind of fall into this trap of doing the same thing over and over I got to figure out like how to you know level up and come up with the, the better solutions like the, the real solutions for things and so that was how I was doing it and, uh, and it was awesome you know and then recently I've um, been spending a lot of time uh, in the tattoo industry uh, teaching seminars and stuff like that and getting to know a lot of guys and um, so they like they love doing drink and draw stuff there so uh, like getting to hang out with those guys and, and since most of those guys are self-taught like they're really hungry for knowledge and for, for you know art school whatever and um, so being out with those guys and kind of it's kind of reinvigorated my uh, my need to like level up again so yep um i was just wondering is there are there any common book like artists that you're a fan of no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they're all competition yeah. Yeah, that's right. that was a thing like i got frozen uh like when i was maybe 19 or 20 i had this moment where i thought like oh my god all my heroes are now my competition and like I froze for like a good six months. Like I had like really freaked out, and then I like came to realize it's not really like that. Like it's not like that at all. Um, no, there are a ton of comic book artists I love. Um, honestly, the stuff I like the most um, are the old EC comics from the 1950s. Uh, so like Tales from the Crypt era stuff. Uh, all those guys eventually became Mad Magazine, which is like I learned to read on Mad Magazine. That was like my intro to comics um, and so those guys are my heroes um, but I mean yeah like um, Jeff Darrow who does Shaolin Cowboy uh, he's one of my absolute heroes I've got a tattoo on my arm here from uh, Hard Boiled um, uh, Doug Mankey who does a ton of stuff for DC like that guy's a beast like, just came off Superman he's a guy he's I mean he's a beast of a man and he's a He's a hell of an artist. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'm sitting right next to Glenn Fabry. I'm like yeah. crying so hard to keep my shit together all weekend. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there, are, there are loads of guys that I love. Yeah. Jack I mean, Davis was a big one for you, wasn't it? Jack Davis is the be all end all for me. Yeah, he is the he is the quintessential cartoonist of the 20th century. I mean, everything from Mad Magazine to uh, Rankin Bass cartoons to Newsweek and Time magazine covers uh, to a variant for Fury. <laughs> yeah, to a variant for Fury. Uh, uh, yeah, Raid, you know, the old cartoon yep. Raid commercials. I mean, if, if you can think of it, Jack Davis did it. I mean, he set the pace for all of us, like from 1952 to now. Yeah. Uh, so there's not a problem on the page that Jack Davis didn't already solve. So I, I always turn to him for solutions. Yeah. Is there anything you're reading right now? Um, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm real good at buying books, and then I put them in a stack. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be honest, as a shop owner, I've got one of those stacks too. Yeah. Uh, I think by buying the book, then the information automatically, uh, like osmosis, it beams into my head. Um, I'm real good at that. Uh, I, I'll read anything Jason Aaron writes. Um, Southern Bastards is one of my favorite books. Uh, he and Latour are crushing it. Yeah, uh, I love the I love the art Latour is doing on that thing. Like he's just. Uh, he's it's a, nice to see him back to that after doing like Spider Gwen with somebody else. With Rodriguez. Yeah, Rodriguez. Yeah, Rodriguez. Um, you know, and that's awesome stuff yep, too. Like sure. my kid and I enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, he he and Latour on that thing are are on fire. Uh, and I I worked with Jason a little bit on Ghost Rider and. I mean, I've, I've loved his work since uh, The Other Side. That was like his first yeah. book. Uh, I met him at the comic shop. Like, I lived in Kansas City where he lives. And uh, like he had a pitch in at Vertigo, and it was The Other Side. And he was like nervous. And I was like, dude, I think you're going to be fine. Uh, yeah. And then watching him just like take over the industry. Yeah. I, like, I, like, I mean, I got to work with him for three issues on Ghost Rider. And he could write the instruction manual for VCR and I strangled 10 of my best friends to write to draw it <laughs> <laughs> oh we'll go back to the Tyler first um, uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, I saw this uh, article of this company that was creating um, um, these autistic superheroes, and I have autism myself. So, um, like, since like Black Panther and then Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman, and we're get and we're getting so many superheroes of equality and um, and gender and like and so and so many, but we just don't have like ones of like of like people with like autism and I know Hawkeye in the comics he's deaf I think and um, and um, so like was there like is there like like would there one day be like any like like hopefully like Marvel and DC and or other combo companies would do like characters for autism because like you know they do have a really big part in like you know the geek world and like including myself and stuff like that for sure I mean uh, I think diversity and uh, I think all companies are, are starting to recognize that, that um, representation really matters for an audience. Um, like, it, it hit me just the simple fact, like, I've got a, a daughter, and she's just getting into comics, and she got really into the Avengers. And so for her birthday, or for Christmas uh, a couple years ago, I bought her those Titan Heroes, the big mm -hmm. plastic Barbie doll size guys, and I bought her the Avengers set because she loved the Avengers. And she ripped open the paper, and she like saw it, and got excited, and she panned across, and then like I saw the joy kind of drain out of her face, and she's like, "There's no Black Widow," oh, and then that hit me uh, like, that's why she loved it because she saw herself, yep. and then she didn't see herself, and it like hurt her, and uh, so yeah, I mean I think companies realize that now, like, you know that's why you see a push for Marvel to to represent more people because it connects you know with us as humans to see ourselves in these stories and uh, so yeah I, I think it's probably just a matter of time you know, um, if it's not already like in the pipes. I was going to say I'll be honest I, and I don't know this for sure at all Tyler but I wouldn't be shocked if there's something at Image that has a character with be it autism or, or any other sort of developmental delay I wouldn't be shocked by that not something I could tell you right off the top of my head but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, like gender diversity, cultural diversity, you know, um, racial diversity, neurodiversity. Yeah. Like it, it's it, it'll all eventually find its way into the books. I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't read it, but I know the new Skyward book from from Image has a character with no legs, and he's able to write this character because there's no gravity in the world, or at least not to the same degree that it is now. So, him not having legs doesn't matter anymore. So he's able to use that as a as part of the story, so. I, but again, I wouldn't be surprised. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be shocked. So are you, I think you had another question. Oh uh, yeah, um, outside of um, comics, who are your heroes in a sense? Like anyone you admire? Like art heroes or just people in general? Uh, just people in general. Uh, well, Tom Cruise, we were talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, God. <laughs> Uh, jeez, I don't know. Like, I got I got plenty of uh, my own kind of uh, ideological differences with guys like Elon Musk and whatever. But boy, I, I love a crazy billionaire. Like, yeah. <laughs> seeing seeing guys like Richard Branson and Elon Musk who like take the fortunes and turn you know these Howard Hughes like yep. empires and like I'm gonna build a crazy ass thing like I mean that's Tony Stark in real life. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I get excited by that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's hmm, I'm trying to think like I mean guys who are like my hero like I don't know that's a weird. It's a weird thing because like heroes like all my heroes are artists you know like I I meet celebrities and stuff like that and it's super rare that I get like starstruck but I, I met Jeff Darrow at a comic-con and I walked around his table 20 times before I got <laughs> the nut to just step up and say hi like um, uh, for fear agent I contacted Jack Davis to do a cover um, he passed away last year but no uh, I mean, I, this guy kind of, you know, informed my whole life. Like, I probably wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for him. And uh, so I wanted to reach out and get him to do this. And I seriously, I paced back and forth in front of my phone for a half hour in like a flop sweat, just thinking like, do, am, should, am I even 
worthy of picking up the phone and addressing this guy? Like, how do I? And so, but it's weird, you know. Like, I can meet celeb like people from TV or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, it. <laughs> and it'll be like some guy that most of the world has never heard of. And yeah. like, I'm sitting like, like chewing my fingernails and like sweating thinking about talking to him, uh, just because you know it's I, like their art has like meant so much to me. Like I said, I mean, I'm sitting right there next to Glenn Fabry. I mean, this guy. Like when I, if I if teenage me knew that like today I would be sitting right next to him and he would like I'm filling myself full of coffee but he's buying me beers and I can't say no. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's actually uh, just really quickly like Tony and I met many 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 years ago and in all honesty he probably doesn't really remember it because it was at. A sure in Chicago, <laughs> but uh, it made me laugh because I I'm actually friends with other people that he's friends with, guys like Jeremy Hahn and Jason Latour and B. Clay Moore, mm -hmm. and we were standing there the one day, and my buddy and I, who's now my business partner, were like, we're going to get food. Do you guys want anything? And and they were all like, yeah, we want cheeseburgers and cheeseburgers and cheeseburgers. And then I walked out of Tony's table. I was like, do you and your wife want anything? And he was like, yeah, we'll take a Big Mac combo. I said, okay, no problem. So we took off. And we were Canadians in Chicago. And we went to McDonald's. And we're also talking probably 10 years ago at this point. And so we went into McDonald's and we bought everything. And it cost me like $4. You know, it's not like McDonald's here where you buy a Big Mac combo and that alone is 15 bucks. You know? yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's like $4. We, so we come back and we just drop all these bags of cheeseburgers because I don't know why that's all they were eating. And I brought the Big Mac combo down and they're like, what do we owe you? And I'm like, it's fine, guys. I'm like, it cost me five dollars. Who cares? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, we gotta pay you. And I'm like, it's fine. No, we gotta pay you. And I'm like, it's fine. They're like, we gotta pay you. I'm like, guys, I promise you, it's okay. And I don't honestly don't remember if it was Tony or his wife, but they're like, that's fine. Here's a twenty. It's right there on the floor, and we're leaving it there. <laughs> well, here's the rule: don't ever argue with my wife. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, and if you come back, I'm giving you a deal on art. If so, and I was like, yeah. Okay. If she says something's happening, that shit is happening. Yeah, I, I picked up the toy and I bought art the next day. <laughs> Sorry, you had another one. Um, was there, was there ever a time where, you, like, you were approached by a writer and you had to reject them that they asked you to to come on board for their stuff? Yeah, I mean, I've had a few projects that I either, it was something that I felt like this is a project I'm going to be spending like a good, maybe maybe a year, maybe, if it really takes off, it might be the next several years, it could be like the foreseeable future. And so at that point I had to think like, is this a project that is worth maybe deferring my own personal projects for like if I'm gonna kick my own personal can that much further down the road before I address it then maybe and if I if I'm not okay with that then I gotta you know then I gotta pass um, you know I mean I got I got offered um, uh, I had Swamp Thing and uh, some Jonah Hex stuff offered to me uh, around the same time and I was working on a book at uh, Vertigo called The Exterminators uh, that I co-created and it was being canceled and it was in its final issues and part of me was like fuck it this thing's dead let it rot like <laughs> but, but then at the same time I was like you know like I should hold its hand as it slips into the darkness uh, you know so I couldn't just ditch it out on the last like two issues you know yeah so but the, these you gotta other, be there for these the other projects, like that's when they hit, and I was like, "Whatever comes I, first, I really. can't." You know, like I want to, and it breaks my heart to say no, because like I lived my whole life wanting you to ask me this question, and now that you have, I can't. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, that shit happens. It's rough, but I'm just gonna deal with it. Sure. Uh, I'm an artist as well, not. Not a comic book artist, I sculpt, mold cast, that kind of thing. Cool. There are a time where you just don't think you're very good at what you're doing, you just wanted to give up. Just about every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, how I do you get through stuff like that? Is it it's your wife that gives you the, the kind of personal support, or you just kick yourself in the butt and say, stop being so stupid, or what? Like, uh, yeah, mostly curious. that. Mostly that. Yeah. Um, you know, like, <clears throat> I, I grew up on a farm. And, um, 
you know, so almost everything we had, we had to either make it or grow it or hunt it ourselves. Yeah. And um, one thing that that instilled in me is that like anything I need, I can get. You just gotta do it. Um, and so, like that's that's ultimately it. Like I mean, we yeah. live in a comfort age where if I don't want to grow my own food, I can just go to the fucking grocery store. It's not yeah. that big a deal. But there's like a level of satisfaction that comes with doing the hard work that brings you the thing. Um, so ultimately, like that's the thing that keeps me moving. And right. you know, now that I have a kid, like that's like I'm the the example. You know, like I have to show her like yeah. you don't just fold um, because. A lot of times that's the easiest solution. That's the the first thing that comes to my mind sometimes is like just, you know, bail, just fuck yeah. this thing. Um, but I don't want her to see that. I don't want her to right. to think that that's the, the go-to option, you know. So, I mean, I'd say on any given piece, uh, an integral part of it is about two-thirds of the way through, I want to rip it up and put it in the garbage. Fighting yourself about it, you're like, oh, yeah. Man, this I mean, especially like a painting, like I have to fight the physical urge to destroy the piece in front of me and start over. Yeah. That's not going to get me anywhere. It's just going to be all the time that I spend. It's just going to be lost altogether. So I just figure out how to like uh, calm myself down, look yeah. at the piece, yeah, try to be objective about it, solve the problems. Okay soldier it through because that's all you can do I mean um, you know whether it's coloring any part of the process honestly you, you know if it comes easy like is it that good to begin with you know like uh, almost almost anything worth having comes with a certain element of struggle um, and that includes all artistic stuff I think you know if, you, if you're not working outside of your comfort zone and having to solve some kind of problem with it and have you grown and have you made something worthwhile at all? Precisely. Honestly. Thanks, man. Good luck. As a, as a follow-up <laughs> to that, I'll ask you a question that got asked in the panel that I did with Glenn. And have you ever gotten to the point with a piece of art where even three quarters, almost done, and you just destroyed it by accident? Coffee or anything like that? Uh, what, Glenn had a great story. If you haven't heard, you got to ask him. It led to people thinking he beat his wife. <laughs> uh, no, I. Um, I mean, I've I've had a few pieces like uh, sometimes if I use like uh, the brush pens and stuff, uh, the ink in those doesn't like to dry quickly, right. and I'm heavy, I'm sloppy. That's why most of my work looks like it does because I'm, I'm I can't do those like vector clean lines. I'm just not that guy. Um, but so I was working on a piece for. Um, uh, signing in Wisconsin not too long ago, and uh, I spent, I had most of it drawn. I'd already done almost the whole piece, and uh, I smeared a couple lines, and I was like, that's all right, just keep on moving, keep on moving. And then I got it where I needed to clean up some of the pencils in a couple areas that I'd already inked, and uh, everything looked dry, you know, like I could touch it, it didn't seem tacky or whatever, and I took my eraser and started to go, and everything and like I mean it was too much to ignore and like right. too much to, it was gonna take me a hell of a long time to clean it all up because I was gonna have to go in and like white out a bunch of this and I flipped out. I mean I lost my shit. And my wife That's how Glenn's story went. My, my <laughs> wife was sitting in the kitchen. I mean I'm lucky I live in the sticks because if I'd had neighbors, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean I'd like I I picked it up and like ripped it into little pieces, threw it across and my wife's like, what is that? I was like, oh, and I, I just hopped out for a minute. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, I had a few of those. I, I've, I've developed a strict uh, fluid policy in my office. So like, I have work surface and I have fluid surface. So I have, like, the never, they, they never meet. Um, so I don't spill coffee on my pages anymore because I did that a couple times. <laughs> um, yeah, and you get burnt couple times on that you it's a hard lesson you yeah. learn real fast and you learn it real well um, uh, so yeah I mean you know but I mean I've had pa pieces that like yeah like paintings and stuff like that where I think things are going well like, you know what this thing needs maybe I need this and it, like there's no undo button on that shit. <laughs> like, uh, and so then you gotta figure out like how do I solve this problem and it's it's all about problem solving really 
just kind of controlling your emotions enough to not just wreck it all. Because yeah. <laughs> plenty of days where I just want to burn the whole place down and just walk away. <laughs> sure, we'll go up front here. Okay. Um, when you work on a page, do you usually um, work it all at once or do you take breaks throughout the day? Uh, it depends on how distractible I am. Um, you know, every day is different. But so one thing I do uh, with any any book, uh, I, I go through and I do all my layouts before I even start a page, before I draw any single page. I have all the whole book laid out at two inches by three inches. I don't know what that is in metric system, like the kilometers. Uh, <laughs> I, I just got it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I draw them all about that big. I draw the whole page that big. And it keeps me from getting hung up in all the little noodly bullshit. I just focus on figure placement, mm -hmm. angles, only the important stuff. And then I do the whole book like that. And then I have a sense of how the whole story goes. And as I'm going, if there's something at the end of the story that I need to see it a little bit at the beginning, then I can do that. Uh, but if I'm just starting, like, page one of the script, draw the page. And then, like, ten pages in, I'm like, oh, shit, that happened. Like, I could have could have done that, but I didn't know it was coming. So you got to, like, you know, go through and be familiar with what you're about to do. Um, so, yeah, and then I, uh, so I try to work everything up kind of um, from the general to the specific. Um, but, I mean, sometimes you just, you ride the wave, you know, you might be, uh, you know, really on fire. You know, it just be all cylinders pumping and you just, it's coming. It's, uh, and you just got to ride it until it's gone, you know. Uh, and then it might be something so simple as my wife going, hey, can you take the garbage out? And it just derails the whole fucking trail. <laughs> And then I get up and I do it. I come back and I sit down and it's like starting all. It's like I've never done it before in my life, and I was just doing it 20 minutes ago. And like, I sit. And, I <laughs> and, and then like nothing's coming right. You know, like some days you just throw every line you throw is just magic. And yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then sometimes you. Like, nope, nope, that was bad. And then you just you're like you might throw the same line 35 times and it be wrong every time. Uh, and it's it's really frustrating when you have those two days in one day, yeah. Uh, especially when the the good one comes first and the bad one comes after. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. You just try to try to find your ways to you limit your distractions and just try to, like I said, ride the wave. You know, honestly, there's some days where I'm just waiting out the clock. Hoping if I can just get to ten o'clock here, I'm gonna say like I put in a good day. And I, and I got nothing to be ashamed of here. I did a solid day's work, and I'm okay. Like however much I get done, I get done. And then some days are just moving, and I'm like things are going well. And my wife's like, "Hey, it's midnight. Are you plan on coming to bed tonight?" I'm like, "Maybe. We'll see what happens." And I, I'm like, "I gotta go. I'm like it's coming. I gotta take it." You know. And so uh, you just, like I said, it's just riding the wave. And man, it makes it hard on interpersonal relationships sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I can like, see that. It wasn't a mystery. She knew what she was going to do. <laughs> when you work, do you work in silence, or are you one of the guys that's got, like, movies going and or music uh, or podcasts? Or? I do a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I mean, because, like, so, like, I love stories. i got to have stories happening all the time. So, like, I listen to a lot of old country music because it's all stories. Um, I listen to podcasts a lot. If I'm watching a movie, I can't watch anything that I haven't seen before right. or something I'm super like interested in. So I haven't seen any of the new Twin Peaks because I know I'm going to watch it. And if I'm drawing, like I started watching Into the Badlands on AMC. Yeah. And I, uh, I turned I turned it on. I was sitting and drawing, and then like some fighting starts. And I'm like, and then like, <laughs> like I kick out like an awesome fight scene starts. And then the uh, next thing I know, it's been 20 minutes. I'm sitting like this. <laughs> It's like, oh, I got nowhere this episode. Like, that was an hour, it just disappeared. Yeah. Um, so I don't watch anything that I know I'm going to have to look at. Uh, so I do watch a lot of, like, Big Lebowski or True Grit. Like, the things, stuff you know that things I've seen you know so what's many. Yeah, I don't, like, yeah, I can just hear it, yeah. and the whole movie plays in my head because I've already seen it that much. That's what I do in my store. I put on The Office and stuff like that because I'm like, as I hear it, yeah. I know what's going on. Yeah, and that, like, keeping that, because that's the part of me that wants to meander. You know, because the thing that's looking for the story, and if I've already solved the problem of telling the story on the page, 
then that part, like I've already done my layouts. So, you know, as I'm drawing the page, like the thinking work's already done. At that point, it's just executing the page, uh, which is craft, but it's kind of monkey work at that point. Like, I just got to do it. You right. Know, I just got to be the body in the, page, in the chair doing the work. Like, I don't have to think about it as much anymore. Um, so, yeah. So that's when the fight scenes will pull you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if there's like a story about like, what's happening over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair. I know you had a question. Um, I, I asked a lot of villagers this question a lot. Um, what's your take on mangas? On manga? Yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, I mean, it's energetic. It's amazing. I uh, honestly, the I'm working on a creator-owned horror story, and it's gonna be a manga. Um, yeah, I love that stuff. I really love uh, uh, Japanese horror stuff, especially because it's all creepy as. Yes. <laughs> and uh, nobody does it here like they do. So Yeah, they can do crazy things. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to just do some off-the-rails shit. <laughs> yep. Um, I was wondering, what got you into, into like, art and that kind of stuff, like comic books or like anything like that? Uh, well, like I said, I, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Um, so... That was always kind of like my escape, you know. Um, or was the thing that like I could do by myself because I was by myself most of the time. I had a little brother, but I didn't want to fucking play with him. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when you're 10, you don't play a five year old. When was that shit? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was the thing that I could do like by myself. It kept me, it was my little world. Um, and I just happened to get pretty good at it. Um, you know, because I was isolated with it for so long that by the time I started school, you know, I've been drawing like, my whole life. And uh, um, so they say uh, you got to do a thousand bad drawings before you get to the good ones. But, like, I not, I mean, I don't think they were, I was, wasn't really into my good ones yet, but I knocked out a big chunk of my bad ones before I even started school because it's all I did all the time. And I think talent in general, like a lot of people, refer to talent as this nebulous virtue that people are just imbued with. Um, but honestly, all talent is is just a natural predilection to letting something take over your life. Um, because while all my, all, every, every other kid I knew was out learning how to ride a bike or whatever, like, I lived out in the middle of the country, where was I going to go on a bike? <laughs> there was nothing for me to do, so I sat and did my thing. And, uh, yeah, well, other kids were learning how to sink free throws. I was like, eh, I'd rather draw Spider-Man. So, that's what I did. Did you learn how to ride a bike? Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want my kid to learn before I did. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I was nine. It's late, but... You know. not, not by much. I think I was seven or eight. Yeah. yeah. By the time I was 12, I was, like, you know, threatening my own personal life with... <laughs> Stupid evil can evil shit. So That's very caught up quick. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so I guess the last thing I'll ask is, having a daughter now, mm -hmm. do you find yourself wanting to draw something, put something out for her? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you know, I had some ideas that were a lot more kid friendly. That um, even since she kind of, you know, became a like a person, you know. I mean, for a long time, she was just this little yeah. doll of shit and kept me awake all night. Uh, but now she's like a real person. Uh, so I especially want to see, you know, like, and seeing how much representation matters to her. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I had some ideas that I thought were pretty good back then. Um, that, like, at seeing her kind of come online has made me retool those a little bit to make them more for her. Um, so hopefully I'll have those. Just you know, a shape that I can announce before too long. Sounds good. Just All right, guys. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Niagara Falls Comic Con. Please like, comment, and subscribe to see more. And let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.